Let us read together in the Word of God. We are studying the letter to the Romans, and we look again at the 12th chapter for a second morning, the start of the practical section of Romans, really the third part of Romans. Romans is divided into three parts. Uh, The first uh, eight chapters are about the righteousness of God in the salvation of sinners. Uh, Chapters 9, 10, and 11 are about the righteousness of God in history, the question of the Jews and why were the Jews cast off in order that the Gentiles might be brought in. And uh, from chapter 12 to the end of the letter, uh, the theme is the righteousness of God in Christian behavior. And so the whole of Romans is about the righteousness of God. The first eight chapters, the righteousness of God in the gospel. The middle three chapters, the righteousness of God in history. And uh, the last five chapters, (coughs) from 12 onwards, the righteousness of God in Christian conduct. Chapter 12 and verse 1, I appeal to you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that you may prove what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I bid every one among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith which God has assigned him. For just as in one body we have many limbs, and all the limbs do not have the same function, so we Christians, although we are many, are one body in Christ, and individually we are limbs one of another, having gifts that differ according to the grace that is given to us, let us use these gifts. If it is the gift of prophecy, then we must use it in proportion to our faith. If it is the gift of uh, service, uh, diakonia, practical Christian service, then we must use it in our serving. He who exercises the gift of teaching, he who teaches must exercise the gift in his teaching. He who exhorts or encourages in his exhortation. He who contributes must exercise the gift in liberality. He who gives aid must do it with zeal. And he who does acts of mercy must do them with cheerfulness. Amen. May God add a blessing to his holy word. Grant us an understanding of In our morning worship, we have reached the second verse of uh, Romans uh, chapter 12. And that verse really brings us (coughs) to the start of a series of messages on uh, Christian behavior. You remember that the first 11 chapters of Romans are the doctrinal section of the letter. They are the (coughs) indicatives of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But from uh, chapter 12 to the end of the letter, we have the practical section, or the imperatives of the gospel, the moral implications of being a Christian. In uh, verse 1 of uh, chapter 12, uh, Paul lays the basis and the foundation for uh, Christian morality, 
by uh, sending out a call to consecration. And there in verse uh, 1 of chapter 12 we read, I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. And by mercies of God, Paul means the first 11 chapters of Romans. These are the mercies of God for sinners. God acting in the gospel for uh, salvation. God acting in history. These first 11 chapters are the mercies of God. I appeal to you therefore, brethren, by these mercies of God to present your bodies. And the word present there is uh, the word that's used in the Old Testament for the handing over of a sacrifice for the altar. We are to hand over our bodies as a living sacrifice. And that's the paradox of uh, Christian consecration. A sacrifice is a dead thing. But when a Christian hands himself over in consecration to Christ, he becomes a living sacrifice. He is handed over to death, but in the death, he is handed over to resurrection life. We are to hand over our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And the Greek word reasonable there is the word logikos, logikos. It's um, our logical service. It's the most reasonable thing we can do to hand over our bodies to Christ in uh, consecration. That's verse 1. But now in verse 2, <coughs> Paul starts to speak about the evidences of uh, consecration. And there's a good reason for him to write in this way. You see, sooner or later, consecration will show just as uh, sooner or later lack of consecration will show it uh, may take months in some cases it uh, may take years it may take a whole lifetime for consecration or for the lack of it to show but show it will one way or another. For, as Jesus said, by their fruits ye shall know them. And the fruit is always the test of the tree. The outward evidence is the proof of the inner reality of consecration to Christ or the lack of consecration to Christ. Sooner or later, consecration or the lack of it will show. And in verse 2, Paul mentions the first outward evidences of consecration. These are the first fruits in a man or a woman who lays himself or herself on the altar for Christ. Do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewal <coughs> of your mind <coughs> and um, he uses um, two very special words in the Greek there the first is soon schematizo now can you hear the word scheme in the middle of that soon schematizo We are not to be schemed together with this world. And the second word is metamorpho, from which we get the English words morphology, and metamorphos, which means to change your shape. Our thinking is to be changed. Our 
thought life is to be put into a different mold. Our minds are to be metamorphosed. Do not be schemed together with this world, but be metamorphosed, be remolded by the renewal of your mind. And these are the two first fruits, the two outward evidences of Christian consecration, an inner and an outer, the renewal of our minds and non-conformity with the world. Let's start with the first of these uh, this morning. It's almost impossible to overestimate <coughs> the importance that the mind has in the economy of God and of God's salvation for us in Christ. Over and over again, it is hammered out in Scripture. Pay attention to your thought life. Give heed to your thought life. Guard the citadel of your mind. Listen to these uh, familiar words from Isaiah 26. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, double peace, shalom, shalom. Thou wilt keep him in double peace, whose mind is stayed upon thee because he trusteth in thee. You see, nowadays we would say whose emotions are fixed on God or whose inner psychology is directed towards God. But that's not what Isaiah says. Thou wilt keep him in double peace, shalom, shalom, whose mind is stayed on thee. Ephesians 4 and 23. Be renewed in the spirit of your minds. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 2. If then you have risen with Christ, set your minds on the things that are above where Christ reigns. You see, we would say nowadays, set your love on that other world. Fix your emotions on that other world. Direct your psychology to that other world. But that's not what the Bible says. If you are risen with Christ, set your mind on the things that are above. Philippians 2 and verse 3. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus Philippians 4 and verse 8. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just and pure and lovely and gracious, if there is any excellence in these things, if there is anything worthy of praise in these things, think on these things. Think, work at it. You see what the Bible is saying? We are to be metamorphosed in the renewal of our minds. And we have to be changed as Christians there in our thought lives. We are to be saved in our thinking. Let me put it like this. I wonder if you are... Familiar with, uh, familiar with um, John Bunyan's great book, The Holy War. I call it John Bunyan's other book because um, Pilgrim's Progress is more popular and has uh, rather eclipsed the fame of The Holy War. But I think The Holy War is a far better book, more difficult to understand, but a far better book because it's a deeper book in many ways. And it spells out the inner psychology of salvation. And here is uh, Bunyan's story. Some of you may know it. The city of Mansoul 
has been captured by its enemy, King Diabolus, the Prince Diabolus. And the real king, who is uh, Lord Emmanuel, lays siege to the city of Mansoul. And uh, the story of the Holy War is the story of how uh, Emmanuel retakes Mansoul from the wicked prince. Bunyan says, the city of Mansoul is made up of different citadels. There's the citadel of the mind and the citadel of the heart and the citadel of the will. And so Emmanuel it lays siege to man's soul. <clears throat> and in one uh, famous scene, uh, he comes with his great battering ram to ear gate. And on the battering ram are written five words. Ye must be born again. And he hammers ear gate with a battering ram. He hammers it again and again and again and again till ear gate gives way and collapses and the breach is made and Emmanuel is into man's soul and can start dealing with the three great citadels the citadel of the mind the citadel of the heart and the citadel of the will the citadel of the mind is the understanding bit of you. It has to do with your thought life. The citadel of the heart is the feeling bit of you. Your emotional life, your affections. The citadel of the will is the doing bit of you. Your conscience, your volition. And that is the order in which Emmanuel and his gospel make their impact on your soul first of all to your mind do you understand what Emmanuel is saying to you God is speaking to you do you understand what God is saying to you and then once Emmanuel has made an impact on your mind he makes an impact on your, impact, impact on your heart do you love his voice and then an impact on your will. Do you surrender to his voice? Do you respond to his voice? First of all, your mind. Let me tell you the story of um, John Steele, um, who was a, a lovely old chap. He was a miner in my last uh, parish. <clears throat> John Steele came from Ireland in the early days of uh, poverty and hardship at the turn of this um, century when he came over from Ireland he was almost illiterate he could hardly write his name and then he was converted and he um, <clears throat> joined the Christian brethren and the Holy Spirit did a wonderful work of um, quickening in the man's mind and uh, he taught himself to read and to write and to study. All right. Some help I think needed here. Yes. There is a chair in the vestibule and a glass of water. No, it's not important, my dear. It's not important. Not at all. Lovely. It's all right. I think there is some water at the front. <coughs> Let's get back to John Steele. He joined the Christian brethren and... Um, <coughs> When he came to die, I used to visit him, and although we could argue about many things, um, he disapproved of some of the things in the Church of Scotland and so on. We had a lovely time together just before he died, and when he died, I was left three things, two bedroom chairs and his Bible. His 
Bible was a miracle. It was in ribbons, with use, in tatters, all sewn with thread, stuck with sellotape and elastoplast. He went through Bibles. How many Bibles do you go through a year? Billy Graham goes through six Bibles a year. He uses them. They're not holy relics stuck in a glass cabinet. He uses them. John Steele's Bible was a revelation. All up and down the side, annotations, comments, notes, Greek words, Hebrew words, from an Irishman who came to this country almost illiterate. Because he'd been converted to Christ. And the Holy Spirit had quickened his mind. And the citadel of his mind had capitulated to Jesus Christ. Is your mind changing under the preaching of the word? Do you think differently today compared with, say, a year ago, or five years ago, or ten years ago? Is your thinking today more straight, more holy, more clean, more upright, and more Christ-centered? Think of it this way. Your brain is a kind of telephone exchange with cables and wires going all over the place. When there is a revolution, what do the revolutionaries make for first? When Satan wants to corrupt a soul, old or young, Where does he head for? He heads for the mind. He corrupts thinking. He confuses right thinking. Revolutionaries capture the telephone exchange first because that controls all else. And in exactly the same way, being metamorphosed in your mind, being transformed in the renewal of your mind, is one of the first evidences of consecration to Christ. And the second evidence in this second verse is non-conformity with the world. Verse 2, do not be conformed to this world. Do not be schemed together with this world. By our very natures, we are under an obligation to be non-conformists. Because a Christian is in the world, but does not belong to it. The word for world in the New Testament is cosmos. And it's sometimes aeon, as it is here, A-E-O-N. And cosmos and aeon mean the system, the present set up against God and against Christ and against, against all that, that the gospel stands for. The cosmos, the aeon, subject to principalities and powers, and subject to the demonic. And the Christian is in this world, but he doesn't belong to it. His home is not here. His destiny is not here. His end is not here. The Christian's home and destiny and end are somewhere else. They're not in this world. And so a Christian uses the world without abusing it. And he lives in the world, but he knows that he's only passing through. And above all, he refuses 
to conform to the world and to be shaped by it and molded by the world's uh, values. I find this um, a very useful principle in my own uh, living as a Christian. And here it is. It may help you. <clears throat> the outward forms and expressions of worldliness change with changing generations. But the spirit of worldliness and the power of worldliness remain the same. Let me give you some innocent examples from uh, last century. Uh, last century, <clears throat> it was considered very naughty for a Christian girl to read novels. It was uh, the height of wickedness for uh, a young Christian lady to be caught reading a novel. It was uh, considered questionable for Christians to go to the theater because uh, the music halls in those days were rather bawdy and uh, characters like Vesta Tilly, Florrie Ford were rather vulgar, rather coarse. Cards were questionable, not because it was considered wrong to play cards, but because of the associations with gambling. Cosmetics for ladies were considered uh, questionable. Uh, too much paint, uh, too expensive perfumes, although nowadays the men seem to be involved with that as well. <clears throat> Cultural things too, over on the continent. Dutch hyper Calvinists smoke cigars. German evangelicals drink lager and smoke cigars. Martin Luther was a great beer drinker. I'm sorry to have to say it here, but John Calvin liked wine. And part of his salary was paid in casks of wine. The point is, these are outward expressions of worldliness. They are expressions of the cosmos and the aeon in which we live with its values. <clears throat> they change. They vary. They alter with passing years. But the spirit of worldliness and the power of worldliness goes on. And that's the thing that Christians have to uh, fight against. You know, it's a great principle for a young Christian to learn that you don't have to do things that everybody else is doing. In my young day, giving my age away now, it was smoke craven A for your throat's sake. Well, I wonder what they would make of that now. It was 30 years ago. Uh, today, it's... Uh, drink martini it's the bright one it's the right one extra dry waiting to be discovered it's very clever extra dry waiting to be discovered <clears throat> I could show you the homes and the lives of some people who have discovered Martini. They're in mental hospitals being treated for serious alcohol problems.
You don't have to do what everyone else is doing. You don't have to adopt the moral standards of television. Surely you know that the ethical standards of shows like Dallas and Dynasty and Coronation Street are anti-Christian. They're anti-God. Their ethos is against the ethos of the gospel and the message of Jesus Christ. These are not ethical values from Scripture. The Bible has two things to say about that. The first is this, and this is pretty final. Friendship with the world is enmity against God. And secondly, the fashion of this world passes away. It sure does. That's why it's such a struggle to keep up with it. Because by the time you've caught up with the fashion, it's moved on. Have you ever watched a stream with dead fish in it? They drift down with the water. Why do they drift down? They drift because they're dead. Living fish swim against the stream. They fight against the stream. Of course, it's a struggle. It's more difficult to swim than it is to drift. But swimming against the stream is the only evidence that you are alive. What do you want? Do you want to swim against the current of the world and get to heaven when you die? Or do you want to drift with the tide of humanity and end in hell? Two evidences of consecration. A mind that is being renewed and metamorphosed. A thought life that's being changed. And secondly, not being conformed to this world, to its standards and to its values, which are against Christ. Do not be schemed together with this world but be metamorphosed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Amen. May the Lord add a blessing to his holy word.